The rise of the first-person shooter in the 1990s left shockwaves across the industry. With DOS PCs rising in prominence from the power available, action games with smooth 3D visuals finally became a reality. At least if you are able to afford one of them. Thankfully, those not in that position didn't miss out entirely. But for every console port of Wolfenstein 3D or Doom, there's always those games which sat on the sidelines to try something that bit different, offering a more console-friendly take on the first-person experience. One such game is Bloodshot, released for the Mega Drive in 1994, developed by Domark and published by Acclaim, at least in PAL regions. For those in North America, it was available on the Sega channel under the name Battle Frenzy, a name also used for its release in Germany. Bloodshot certainly knows how to set an opening impression, as I found both its backstory and the opening intro to set that mood right from the get-go. The visuals here are quite detailed and really set this desperate tone with what you'll be getting yourself into. You're deployed as part of a team of crack marines to take out the core ship in an enemy fleet heading towards the Earth. This fleet was detected in the aftermath of an attack on a moon base, where the attacking craft was boarded by other marine forces. As things seem to go, there's a weakness. Boarding the central craft and blasting away its set of plasma nodes, which is where you come in with your bloodshot battle frenzy chip installed. It's time to take the fight to the mechanized alien forces. Each level of the central ship is set up in a maze, as you'll need to work your way through it. As you'd expect, things are more in the vein of Wolfenstein 3D here, offering textured walls and 90 degree corners for the level geometry. The levels are somewhat smaller in nature, which is a logical byproduct of the Mega Drive's hardware capabilities, but honestly, they never really felt cramped. Well, at least not until the final phase, where you'll need to hightail it back to the entry point before time runs out once you blast a level's plasma node. One of the positives of this is that it truly brings an arcade-style feel to the genre, something that other shooters had eschewed by this point. But before I can really go into detail about that, there is one elephant in the room which has to be mentioned. The wall textures. Those glitched out wall textures. They're present even using the original cartridge on real hardware. Having to accept them can certainly change your experience up a bit, especially because at the time of writing, there's no restoration patch to fix them up. So if you're gonna play the cartridge version, you're gonna have to get used to them. Though there is one way to experience them without that problem, and that is through the Mega CD version of the game. However, there's a few trade-offs of that over the cartridge version, which we'll come to later. So for now, let's return to the mission. Whilst I dig the smaller stages for their arcade vibe, I kind of don't feel the same about how linear they are. But not only that, they're also incredibly tight-knit, and you'll find many points where you're gonna be fighting the enemy forces in very close quarters and can't really avoid taking damage. It's certainly something different, again, compared to other shooters of the time, especially those on PC if you're more familiar with them but it really leads into the need to be very good with avoiding enemy attacks in those close quarters. There's also another incentive in this with Bloodshot's bonus system. Underneath your life's display is a three-part bar with an icon indicating what you'll get. Taking out most enemies lights up an individual segment, and if you're hit, one will be turned off. If you can light up all three, you'll earn a bonus indicated by the icon to the right. This can be one of many items, weapons, keys to secret rooms, extra lives, or plenty of others. I do wish the system included a bit more of a chaining element to it, as it would help work towards earning more points on each stage, and it would give you a great reason to replay the game once you'd mastered it. Something else I found which hindered surviving in those close quarters battles was the strafing controls. Despite coming out in 1994, Bloodshot lacks support for the six button controller, meaning all your inputs are squeezed onto the A, B, and C buttons. Firing is handled with B, and C is relegated to changing weapons. As for A, pressing it in front of a door will open it. Holding it down whilst moving left or right 
lets you sidestep. Now, as for how well that works, it really depends on what controller you're using. The smaller buttons of the six button pads would be far better for this than the older three button controllers, which had larger face buttons. But I really wish that it did support the six button controllers and having separate strafe left and right buttons, because then you could circle strafe. It'd be a tactic which would really help when battling the plasma nodes. Something that helps your survivability though, are the weapons. You start out with a basic blaster, which has unlimited shots, but rather low damage potential. It's your main weapon throughout the game, unless you can hold on to ammo for the other weapons you'll find. These cover more traditional types. The rapid fire pulse rifle, which does as it says on the tin, to the grenade launcher, which can let you have a bit of breathing room between targets as you dish out the damage. One of my faves is the lock-on, which will track the closest visible enemy, allowing you to focus on dodging over precise aiming. It's joined by the tri-bolt, which launches three shots at a time, covering a greater arc and allowing for less precise firing. Along with the ricochet, which fires bolts that could rebound around the room, giving you a chance to hit that target even if you missed it, directly firing at it. Up at the high end of things though, I really dug the piercer, a gun which launches shots that can fire through walls. You can see why that's quite beneficial with these level designs. There are also some other heavy duty weapons on offer, though I didn't really get to find them during my run, so I can't really discuss them in detail. That being said, I'm not really a fan of the way it manages them though. Rather than finding them and collecting ammo to top them up as you play, you'll find complete weapons. So you can in fact carry multiple instances of the same weapon. Each has their own set of ammo rather than drawing from a wider pool. Though of course, you're free to switch between them at any time, really to find what best suits your current situation. This sounds neat in practice, but I found it annoying that it removed access to your base blaster. Yeah, the blaster's not great, but sometimes you really want to save your ammo for the tougher enemies or to help make short work of a plasma node or two. But because you can't switch to it, you've got no choice but to use those weapons and sometimes the blaster might just be the more effective weapon for the current situation. Of course, as you explore, you will find ammo pickups that will restore the ammo to every weapon in your inventory, so it swings in roundabouts, I guess. As for the alien forces themselves, you'll find there's a bit of a short roster of who you'll be dealing with here. Now, some may decry it, but I kind of find that a small cast of foes can also be more memorable at times. You'll start out facing cannon fodder types like the sentries, which patrol levels on foot. They're joined by some devious ones, like the beasts. These mutants carry a protective shield which is only vulnerable to weapons like the piercer and the grenade launcher, and if you're not packing those, then you're going to have to wait until their shields come down before you could direct a volley of destruction their way. The greater threat comes from the likes of the Tatbot and the Borg. Giant hazardous fusions of machine and monster which truly require some heavy duty firepower to dispatch. Again, even with a small cast of enemies like this, there are plenty of tactics and tricks that you're going to need to learn in order to survive the threat they'll put upon you and the wider mission. When it comes to the presentation, I really love the plasma backgrounds used on the menus, along with the intro sequence. These really give off that 90s European vibe, which kind of fills me with plenty of joy for obvious reasons. Though the only story sequence you see is this intro, I really found it made a neat way to set things up before you dived in. Despite the glitched wall textures, the art style carries over in-game as well. Each level has its own base colour palette, which helps ease any sense of repetition you may get from navigating such tight corridors. To go with that, the enemies carry their own style with those terrifying biomechanical forms. It brings quite a sense of grotesqueness to the tougher ones you'll face and reinforces the terror they're going to bring to an unwary marine. Most importantly though, their designs stand out excellently against the level textures. It might not be much, but it goes a long way to help with aiming for them at longer distances. 
It also helps in recognizing that there is a threat at long range, something the general lower resolution of the game might impact in some way or another. This clarity also applies to the weapons and item pickups you'll encounter as well. Again, I found this especially important to help survive the challenges within each level. Something which also applies to the mines you'll encounter during your travels as well. The sound makes for the first big difference between the Mega Drive and Mega CD versions of the game. Sound effects are better on the Mega Drive version, a side effect of the cart being able to easily pull data in. The Mega CD version though, loads each level in before starting, meaning it has to pull it from RAM and there's less memory for that. The music varies even more though. For the Mega Drive version, Mike Ash's soundtrack is more ambient in nature, using the FM hardware to create a droning atmosphere of tension as you work your way through the levels. It's a great differentiator to other games of the time, which tend to feature hard rock stylings, or approximations thereof, in their soundtracks. It's no surprise to say the Mega CD version takes advantage of the CD format, replacing the distinctive sound of the Mega Drive's FM synthesis with CD Redbook audio. But that just doesn't mean the ambient droning is now replicated in CD form. Not at all. What you get instead is more upbeat electronica, and yeah, I think it fits in rather well. Either version of the soundtrack is a good fit for the game. I will say though, the music track which is played on the Mega CD version as you make your way back to the docking bay to complete a level, really adds to the intensity here. This pace of this tune keeps building up over the short period you have to make it back, and as you get close to running out of time, it really makes you feel it. This contrasts quite heavily in fact with the Mega Drive version where no additional tune is played here. Instead, you've still got the traditional ambient droning going on as you're doing this. It makes the retreat back to the docking bay far less intense and more haunting as a result, even though you are under the same time pressure in order to get back there in time. On the performance front, considering the additional capabilities the Mega CD offered as an upgrade, and it might be a surprise to say it doesn't really offer much of a boost over the Mega Drive version. Then again, whilst it might not be at the level you'd expect on a high-end PC of the time, I did find Bloodshot's overall performance to be pretty solid and run at a consistent pace, no matter what was going on on screen. This, combined with the size of the view window in-game, really means you get a good view of the action all up, even if it can be a little chunky at times. It's certainly a step up from the view windows offered in other Mega Drive based shooters. Where the Mega CD version truly feels better to play for me though, is in some additional tuning that it has. The big one is the addition of an easier difficulty level, which I found made the game more enjoyable to get into compared to that of the original Mega Drive release. It really made the game far more approachable and easier to survive with, which based on some of the things we talked about earlier, you can see why that's quite beneficial. Something else which wasn't quite as impactful, but still beneficial, was the rearrangement of the level order. It's the type of refinement that helped the difficulty curve feel much smoother as a result. The challenge becomes far more fun because you're not punished as heavily. And that's really the key thing about Bloodshot for me. Yes, it's absolutely limited by the hardware capabilities of both the Mega Drive and Mega CD, but this ultimately doesn't matter. Its arcade focus from its scoring system, the level structure, and the bonus power-up mechanics really make it feel quite a bit different from other first-person games of the time. The visuals and the soundtrack don't harm either. Whether you prefer that ambient FM synthesized music in the cartridge version, or the dance floor stylings of the Mega CD's Redbook Audio, you're going to be in for a treat. The only real downpour if you want to play the Mega Drive cartridge version are the glitched out wall visuals. If you don't mind them, 
then you can have a great time here and of course it's the tougher version by default so it's more of a challenge for you to get into. Otherwise, stick with the Mega CD version if you have the means to play it, as that visual problem isn't there, and of course you've got the easy mode which I know I enjoyed a lot more. I had a lot of fun with Bloodshot, and if you're open to trying out a first person shooter which may not be as refined as those groundbreaking PC games, then I'm sure you can have a blast with it as well. And with that, there's nothing more to say than thank you very much for watching yet another Beyond the Scanlines.